good evening and welcome to our last fall series um, this year, which, you know, seeing as the first one was last week, we didn't exactly have a huge season. Um, we are very pleased to have with us tonight Dr. Susan Fisherpoth, who has probably one of the coolest jobs I've ever heard of. She has been all over the world. Um, I was telling her today about our massive earthquake back in August, and uh, I got no sympathy because she lived in Turkey. So, I got nothing. Uh, she also, uh, she and her husband are the author of this book that was released back in uh, 1996 about, uh, called Virus Hunters of the CDC. Um, if you like stuff like the hot zone and stuff like that, very cool book. So, uh, very happy to have her with us. So, please doc uh, welcome Dr. Susan McMahon. Can you imagine 
what that would be like if you had to live through this experience. We get back going, oh, we've got this terrible disease coming, we're going to have flu or something. It's nothing like we have had in the past. And these are the kind of stories that are still possible, but in this scale, probably not that likely because we've got much more clever at dealing with them. The least we understand is now caused by a flea and rat, not a miasma coming off the marshes. So uh, there you, you have a kind of illustration. So let me fast forward to 1967. The surgeon general, William H. Stewart, I don't know who was president in 67, because at that stage I was still in England, so I wasn't paying any attention. But he testified before the United States Congress that the war against infectious diseases had been won. <laughs> nice job. So that same year, 1967, in Germany, we're going to go back to Germany now, because this is where it happened. We have Augsburg. That's where I showed you the Miss Hill's mortality from. In 1967, Marburg, not far away. What happened in Marburg in 1967? Can you tell me? Green monkey disease. This was a first recorded phylovirus outbreak. Phyloviruses, and I'll show you a picture later, are Ebola and Marburg. 31 cases, 7 deaths, 23% mortality. They'd all been infected by hand and lung from monkeys recently imported by London from Uganda. And this was a whole detective story. I haven't got time to go into it. Where the monkeys had been, where they'd been caught, where they'd been held, and looking in London Airport to see if anybody was sick there, and they weren't. And some of the monkeys from the same ship went to Belgrade, where there were other cases. But there was an ongoing epidemic in the monkeys. And people who were handling monkey tissues and in those days, who worked in a lab? Worked in a lab? <laughs> no. Well, they worked with broken glass, they mouth pipetta, they did a whole load of things we don't do anymore. And so they managed to infect themselves by handling these monkeys. So I'm going to fast forward you again, maybe because we have a great deal of time, and there were all sorts of ancillary stories. But they said in Marburg at the time, it was terrifying, I knew the virologist who worked in the lab and they said they were working late at night to try and figure out what it was, and they could hear the sirens of the ambulances taking people to the hospital. So it was, it's still a scary situation. But then that was over. Where's it gone? It seemed to vanish completely until 1976. And here, I have to take you not very far from where those monkeys came from, which was <laughs> Uganda, here on the shores of Lake Victoria taking you now to what was then Zaire, to a place called Yambuku. It was an outbreak in Yambuku of a very scary disease, a hemorrhagic fever as it turned out. And these, this was in a hospital. Oops. This is the hospital. It was a mission hospital. In those kinds of areas, this is all the hospital care that is. You would see it, uh, it was being run by some Belgian nuns. These were very good ladies. They were doing what they were good, and they were actually providing the only medical care in that area. But this equipment here, you'll see on a table, was all they had for their um, a prenatal clinic. That was all they possessed. So if you've got 20 women standing outside, you've got one, two, three, four syringes, one speculum, and a couple of pairs of forceps and you don't know much about sterilization, you can imagine what starts to happen, and it did. And so what they had was this outbreak of Ebola hemorrhagic fever. Now this is a different virus. It's very closely related, but it's quite different. And this virus had an outbreak, and this is an epi curve, epidemic curve. My epidemiologists always draw epi curve. Epi curves are very, very simple. It's the first thing you do. You put the dates along the bottom, and you put the number of cases up the side. What you do when you've done that is it gives you a picture of what's going on. And you can start to look at it and say, is this going to help me? Does it make me really understand what's going on? So we have three types of contact history. Contact history, you go and find out what was this person doing before they got sick. And so there was needle contact. 
you saw this slide, that would be needle contact. And then person to person, where people were close together but didn't actually inject it, use equipment on each other, and both. And you'll see how it started with the needle, how it was the whole epidemic was driven by insanitary medical conditions within the hospital. Then it spread to the community. Person to person is more in the community. And then after a while, it petered out because this is not a human virus. It is not a natural infection of humans. It, and you cannot actually sustain this kind of epidemic in humans, which is why all the scare stuff, the goal are really kind of done. People haven't figured out that this is not something like flu that's going to persist in the community. And what is very, very interesting is round about here, right at the end of that curve, is when the team from CDC turned up. And traditionally, this team from CDT turns up when the epidemic is over. And this is classic because the epidemic is usually not this kind of epidemic, it's not a natural, ongoing kind of thing. It's something that's happened, it's very dramatic. It takes you time to find out about it, time to see what it is, time to react and get WHO and everybody else together and somebody buy airline tickets and equipment and this, that and the other and actually roll up on the doorstep. So all these data were collected retrospectively. And so uh, that was the story. And from this outbreak, if you care to go back to the, the details of it, we learned everything that we now know about clinical and epidemiological evolution from this outbreak. And we've never learned anything new since. So it was, it was very nice that, uh, you know, it was not very good that people were there. But this is what happens. So if you want to, if because the outbreak was focused in the hospital, the first thing you really need to know about poor people is they're poor. They're uneducated, but they are not stupid. And we tend to think, Oh, poor and uneducated and stupid, they are not. So what they figure out right away is the hospital is not a place good, good place to go. So in fact, when the outbreak team was trying to find cases, they had to go hunting them in the villages and often bribe people to figure out where the cases were because the people were hiding. Because they thought, if you went to the hospital, you died. And if you went to the hospital and died, then you died and other people around you died. So they, they were wise enough to say that is not a good place to go. So then nothing happened. I sat around for years waiting for something to happen, thinking, you know, it's about time we had one of these. Nothing happened. And uh, until Kikwit in uh, 1995, in Kikwit, which is a hospital further south in, in, in Sahelia, now the Democratic Republic of Congo, euphemistically named. And this was an outbreak that had, if you look at it, this is the same pattern. And what happens is that one person comes in with the infection, somebody misuses equipment for surgery on these people because they have abdominal pains. So that, what does the surgeon do? He operates. Sometimes he doesn't even look to see whether the patient has got a fever, goes straight in and he infects himself and everybody else around him. And then the outbreak is in hospital based and then peters out in the communities. So exactly the same pattern. So, once again, a CDC team came in, but I think it's pretty clear they made actually no impact on the epidemic. It was it sorted itself out, which is what these things do. So this this went this then disappeared again. This is a great disappearance and reappearance of where it's happening, where's it coming from, why is it suddenly popping up? Nobody ever knew who the primary cases were. So Marburg, if you remember, was the first disease in Germany, and I'm talking about Ebola. And so what is the story about Marburg? Where's Marburg gone? It's vanished. We never saw it again. We never saw another case. We never saw the virus. We never saw anything. So where is it? Where's it coming from? We then discovered that there was an outbreak of Marburg disease mainly in gold miners. Now this was in the northeastern part of, um, of uh, Zaire. Now that is an area on the border with Uganda, which has been totally um, under rebel control for years and years and years with fighting and all sorts of problems. But it's rich in gold. And there were some gold mines which the, um, the West had been mining. The conditions, security conditions made it impossible. 
So eventually they left and closed down the mines. So what did that do? It left a lot of miners with no work, no income, no food, nothing. So what did they do? They bribed the guy with the gun over the entrance to the mine to let them in and they left. And so there was illegal mining. Uh, there were uh, 154 cases and 128 deaths that could actually be recorded. But this has probably been going on for 10 years. Very high mortality. And this is very interesting because the, you notice in Marburg, 31% mortality. This is much higher. We haven't answered that question. We don't know yet why. Many, many missed infections. And there were very few antibody positive survivors. Now, antibodies are what you develop after getting a disease, which tells you you had it and you recovered. This tells you the mortality was high, not many survivors. Those who did survive were mainly minors. And we're back to the injections. We're back to the injections and things because in the developing world in particular, people think that needles are powerful. So they, they like to have injections. So that was in this area here, and then that being dealt with, the next thing we had was an outbreak this time of Ebola. Now there were two types of Ebola, being one from Zaire, or was Zaire, called Ebola Zaire, and one from Sudan up here in the north, which is not quite as, as lethal, but it's a slightly different virus, and happened at the same time as the original um, uh, Yambuko out outbreak. This was in this area of Uganda. It started up around Hulu. Now, some of you may have noticed in the news that some soldiers were sent into northern Uganda recently. And they were sent into this area to try to weed out the Lord's Liberation Army. So the Lord's Liberation Army made this area pretty well impenetrable. And this is where the cases are coming from. So we have no idea of what the original origin of the cases were, or anything like that, because you couldn't get in. But it got into Guru, and it was spread. Now, the Ugandans dealt with this extremely well. They had a barefoot doctor program, where they went out into the community, went door to door to door to door, asking people if they got cases. And they did a very good job themselves in actually controlling this outbreak. So that went on for a while, and was stopped, and then we didn't see anything the disappearance and the reappearance is something we've got to understand in a minute, but we'll talk about that. To 2005, when there was a massive outbreak, now it's Marburg disease. And now it's in Angola. Now, where is Angola? You know where Angola is? It's much further south, isn't it? So uh, it's not in the area where you saw Marburg before, which was Uganda on the border with uh, with Democratic Republic of Congo. So this is a picture I stole from the New York Times. I thought it was very graphic. So let's look at the maps. Here are the outbreaks. The Golden Zaire strain here. There were some there were some outbreaks in Gabon. I have time to tell you about. The Sudan strain are from Sudan and also into Uganda. Marburg virus out here. Bang, down there. So it's kind of far around there, couldn't it? And then there is also one or two cases of Cote d'Ivoire, which you don't need to worry about because they're obviously low. So I'm now going to tell you about something. I don't know anything about but I learned about it because I thought it was fun. It's not my area. Ecological niche model. So what is that? Well, the colleges have this little game they play where they take all the information that they can about an area, uh, what, what soil does it have, what rainfall does it have, what is the incline of the slope, what is the altitude, what are the, uh, what are the plants that grow there, and all the kind of ecological information. And they feed it into a model that tells them where the outbreak started. Okay? So they started with Ebola, this one is Ebola, and they developed this model, and then they saw all the areas where this model fitted. And you can see how it fits into Democratic Republic of Congo. This is the broadleaf tropical rainforest. This is an environment which is different from this map. This is the Marburg map. And then when they did the Marburg map, with where they thought the original cases had come from, they got a different picture. 
and this is more like the high savanna areas. So we now knew that there was a difference in the probable host. What was the host? Where was this coming from? What was the host? So that map just blown up shows you, here you see it. This is where we seen it before, that this area was also at risk. And this is where the Angolan outbreak broke out. And what you will see, there are lots of other areas where you could possibly exist. So lots of the story. Well, we'll fast forward again a little bit to this area. And one of the things that was observed in Gabon where the positives of human outbreaks was an ongoing episiotic in the Great Apes. Now, episiotic is an epidemic in animals. And this was chimpanzees and lowland gorillas. And it has been estimated that the population of lowland gorillas was reduced by about 90% by this outbreak, which was moving in a slow wave across this area. So we, we called it green monkey disease. We were frightened that monkeys might be the origin, but the fact that monkeys did as badly as we did. And any, any species in which an infection does that badly cannot be the natural host. Because if the virus kills everybody else, it's got nowhere to go. And uh, you know, with very rare exceptions. Viruses like to have an equilibrium with the population because it wants more people to infect. If it kills them all, then it goes down with them. So that was made, made sense. So this was going on here. So what happens in this area? This is a picture taken by Joe McCormick. And this is what a lot of these people did in order to get protein to the table. They would go into the forest and they would kill the thing. And they would kill anything that they could eat, and they could eat most everything. And uh, that included monkeys. And so the stories of came in Gabon were bringing home a chimpanzee that was found dead in the forest, and then eating it in the high in the village. And the interesting thing about that epidemic was all the people who got infected handled the fresh meat. Eating it did not give you the infection. So if you're going to eat chimpanzee, make sure it's well cooked. <laughs> And this is what you will see in the markets. And here's the Lola gorilla thinking about Ebola. <laughs> so here you've got the map of this area with primary human cases here and here, and the non-human uh, epidemic going from, uh, uh, from Gabon down into um, the Democratic Republic of Congo. Here it is again. And the, uh, then so one of my colleagues, um, Eric Leroy, did some animal trapping. He, he worked in Gabon, but he was a veterinarian who got interested in Ebola. So he went out and caught some animals, and he was good at doing that. I can't do that. And he caught some bats. Bats are kind of difficult to catch, but he did catch some bats. And these bats are fruit bats, and they live at the top of the jungle canopy. So they don't come in contact with you on the ground. You've got to climb up to the top, and that's not very easy for us. So we don't have those arms that monkeys have. But smaller monkeys can go up there, and smaller monkeys then get sick, come down, and larger monkeys eat them. So you've now got a kind of food chain that can transmit the virus. Anyway, what he found that these bats that he managed to trap were in fact, some of them were infected with Ebola viruses. The first, we had already had indication that bats might be involved from outbreaks in Sudan and in Kenya, where there was a very strong history of bat contact. But here, he actually managed to find it with the bats. And these are the famous bats. And the interesting thing is the distribution of these bats there and here coincides with that um, uh, ecological um, uh, mapping that we saw before. So this, this was all very neat. And the guy who did this did it before this, these, these other data were, were developed. So it, it was a very nice prediction. I thought that was very cool. I sent him an email saying, well, well done. He said, thank you, someone noticed. <laughs> so, so then, um, those of you who can understand what this is, it's um, a bootstrap analysis of the genetic sequence of the viruses. And what this shows is these viruses here, MDA, 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 are from the bats. And that they're related to the Congo, Gabon, and the Zaire, and in fact, the um, original outbreak strains of Ebola. 
Up here you've got Marburg disease, here you've got the Sudan strain, and here is the rest of the strain which never did anything else but did anything in the way, and probably comes from the Philippines. I, I went to the Philippines looking for monkeys to see what was going on there. So I'd like to make sure you recognize this bat. <laughs> And they're very nice bats, all they do is fruit. And this one, who's watching? <laughs> anyway, we have to finish with bats, because what about mother? All that does is explain the whole. So there is a bat called the epauletted fruit bat. And there are lots of them in sub-Saharan. Yeah. And then a friend of ours called Bob Swanapol did a hair-raising experiment in a biosafety level for soup lab in Johannesburg. He got an, he's a veterinarian too, they do these things. So he got all these animals in the soup lab, including you know, monkeys, snakes, rats, whatever, 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 and he put them in the soup lab and injected them with the bowl. He said it was quite, it was quite hairy. They eventually had to abort the snake experiment because they didn't like these Ebola infected snakes, so they got rid of those. But they did keep the rest. And what they found was this one bat was the only one that was persistently infected and didn't get sick. That's what we were looking for. An animal that could was a host of this virus that would carry it and not get sick. And this is the bat. You can see it's quite 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 a friendly bat with other bats. And it's called Rosetus aegypticus and it's um, it roosts in caves in enormous numbers. Very noisy, very false. It is eco you know, it makes all these uh, so sounds we can't compare to each other. And it's also the, have the host of some other viruses. So now it looks as though here's a potential virus. And then they did another study in Gabon, these are our colleagues again, and they captured 1,100 bats. That is a lot of work, I can tell you. And out of that, just four, uh, less than half a percent. Were, were positive from Marburg bats. So now we know why, because the distribution of these bats is the savannah. So these bats live in a different part of Africa. So um, that, that's the story. Here's the virus, which was taken by Cynthia Goldsmith. I worked with her in the 1980s. Of this very beautiful scanning electron micrograph of the virus itself. Philo for <coughs> threads. And uh, it's really quite exciting up here virus to work with. This is a disease, this is an acutely sick patient, and this is one who's recovered, you see she's lost, it's a woman, she's lost her hair, and an enormous amount of muscle mass as well. So it's a very, very debilitating infection even if you recover from it. A little bit of immunology. I did some work with um, colleagues in Gabon, and then in Fort Dietrich as well, and here is a beautiful, beautiful flow cytometry picture from Tom Giesberg. And I'm going to walk you through it. These are the T cells. T cells are the ones that are supposed to protect you against disease, and the various subpopulations of these things. And here on day one after infecting a monkey, you see the populations that are all where they're supposed to be. C8, C8 low, uh, NK cells, C4, C3. You need them all, I can tell you. So what happens on day two is you this population disappearing. These are NK. NK means natural killer cells. Natural killer cells are the ones that see a virus when it first comes in and try and get rid of it. So the virus is getting rid of the cells and the cells get rid of the virus. Day three, oh my god, day four, you've basically not got any cells left. This is what the virus does. And that is why it is so cataclysmic and why it kills, kills people and monkeys quite so fast. So that's a little bit of over the top for um, the Ebola. I'm going to quickly give you some Congo, Crimean, and magic fever on the border with Afghanistan, uh, with Baluchistan, where we worked in the community up there with another one, Congo, Crimean, and magic fever. These are the conditions. I want you just to see what it feels like to live in these areas. And this is where the virus can occur. And this is what it looks like, produces these enormous hemorrhages. These come from, in fact, and as in this guy down here is known in history as the Baghdad bloody face. And you can see why. It's transmitted by a tick, and the ticks live on the sheep in these kinds of conditions. 
we went looking for this, and this is some of our students who worked in Karachi. These young people, are, they are all three still working in Pakistan. They're very smart, and they're very well qualified. I should keep them there. This young man is set up his own research institute in Pakistan. We're working with him again. And I had two of my students out here this summer. This is, a, is an operating room in Quetta in Pakistan. And this is what happened. I found two, two surgeons that turned up at the hospital with a, a disease which looked to me like a hemorrhagic fever. What did they done? They operated on a guy who was a shadow in the area you've just seen. And he'd come in from a very from a remote area with an illness with a lot of bleeding. And they <laughs> he was vomiting blood. So he went to see a gastroenterologist who did the gastroscopy, because that's what they do. They put tubes down to people to see what's going on down there. So he did. And then he found blood, so he brought the tube back out. He called his two surgeons and said, who are here, he said, this guy's got bleeding ulcers, we need to take his stomach out. So they did. They started operating at 10 o'clock at night, and it took them four hours to close the guy up because he was just bleeding everywhere. These people just, just bleed and bleed and bleed. <coughs> and they did, then did their platelet count. Then they came to see me, and we did more platelet counts. And below this level, they should have died. However, we got them in, and we got them on the treatment, or a ribavirin, which we knew would work. And then we said, well, who else was in the operating theater with you? Oh, they said there was a sweeper. A sweeper is a generic word for someone in that part of the world who does all the dirty work, washes out all the bloody rags after the operation, and everything like that, so plenty of contact. So we called up, where was he? He's sick. There's someone going to find him. So we found him, and we brought him in, and he was in the same condition. He treated him too. Here, he ran away. He said, I'm not coming back to you guys. <laughs> um, the other two did very, very well. And here we are, as they were recovering. So that, that story had a happy ending. But a lot of them have not. Because since then, we realized, particularly since the, we went to Afghanistan, that a lot of these outbreaks are happening all over that area. And it is isn't quite a serious problem if you go out into the rural areas. So now I want to finish off with a little bit of Lhasa. We've got some fun here. Because this story started in Nigeria in 1970, after the first Marburg outbreak, you will notice. And this is what appeared in the, in, the, um, in the newspaper at that time. Actually, it doesn't spread in the name so don't worry about that. Killer on the loose. I mean, we, all this kind of drama is pressed just to it. So what actually really happened? What happened was, there had been a lot going on in this area of missionary hospitals. In 1970, there was a missionary hospital. Have we heard this story before? Mm -hmm. And here, a certain nurse, who knows what she was doing, was um, uh, fell ill with fever. She probably might have got gloves. She was probably reusing needles and syringes, a lot of blood contact. And she was evacuated by air to Joss, which is here, and died. Nurse Shaw, was looking after her, fell ill and died. Head nurse Pineo, then appeared, she was evacuated to Lagos, where she stayed for a couple of days while everyone was trying to figure out what are we going to do, what are we going to do, while they were busy panicking with the other part of their brains. And we got to New York. So the next, uh, she survived. In fact, I met her and she's fine now. She's a big source of animal. So here is the caution of tale. Dr. Jordi Casals, who is famous for identifying this virus now, injected serum from Nurse Pineo into suckling mice. He was a virologist. They, this is what virologists did in those days. They put the, they put the virus intracellularly into suckling mice, who then got sick and died. So they did it with this virus, and nothing happened. So it's an arena virus which does not kill suckling mice. What it does is it becomes persistent in the mouse. That, that is, in fact, its natural history. And um, it, it's, it's a native to rodents. And then he worked with the other viruses. And the viruses were probably, uh, it were in cages behind his desk, his patient desk. Who knows, they probably smoked and everything. In those days, people had no sense of, of this kind of transmission. And uh, he, uh, 
his uh, technician became sick and his technician died. He, in fact, survived. Now it became known as the Blood Diamond Virus. Who's seen Blood Diamond? It's, it's worth seeing. This is, this is all real, this is. And this is the area, and it's the area where we worked. And it was first called Yenkin Fever, described by Dr. John Rose, who called it something or other in several my life, something like that. But he described it very well. Now this diamond mining area is very interesting because it's got alluvial diamonds which are on the ground. So one day there's a village, the next day somebody finds a diamond, the next day the whole place is dug up. People pattern the diamonds. And so all these people live in crowded, difficult conditions. And this is what it looks like when they're actually doing the panning. This in fact turned out to be the road that actually carries the virus and it lives in the village houses. So it's also the system, the virus, for life, it gets excreted in the house. It's a much, much bigger problem than Ebola because it's chronic, it's endemic, and very, very more. About five, at least 5,000 people a year um, are in our uh, diet of this virus. So can we now go to a little picture? Because I want to take you to where this happens. This is a picture of the journey to the hospital where we were working.
And these are the kind of conditions people live in. As you can see, that's great habitat for rats. Here is a nurse that I looked after with, with my husband and other people. Um, her name was Jill Sanderson. She called Lassa Fever. She was a midwife with her babies. She was very, very sick. She did not die. We gave her a very few drug and we managed to treat her. She survived. She now has three children. But she was a very, very sick. It was strange to use causes this great puffy swelling of the neck and the, and the face. Never seen it anywhere else. I'm going to skip over some of these because we're running short of time. Just show you this one, because this is a nurse we met in, in Nigeria, and she had been a theatre nurse during an outbreak that had operated on somebody with massive fever. This was happening all the time. In Sierra Leone, we had a, a, a student, a PhD student, who decided to do a study on hearing loss. Why hearing loss? Well, you can get hearing loss with a lot of viral infections, but with massive fever, it's very, very common, and uh, really amazingly common. So he studied people with massive fever. Here you have a patient's left ear and right ear, and here you have when they were first, um, bit, when they were the, the, the purple line is when they were still very sick, and the higher the line, the better the person hears. So to begin with, they could hear low frequency and high frequency, not at all, in either ear. Totally, completely deaf. Then recovered over time, but you see in the right ear still a high tone deafness. Anyone with high tone deafness, you can get it from massive fever, and it's very, very common. We came across a surgeon who had this problem. He'd operated on the patient, infected himself, and he had very severe, persistent hearing loss. And he said to David, who's working here, oh, you know what happens when I eat a dish full of chilies? I can hear better. So David went in and said, let's do a chili experiment. <laughs> so he gave the guy chilies to see whether he could hear better. But he had a lot of problems because the guy was new and he was eating chilies. And you have to do what's known as blind your experiments so that the patient does not know which you're giving them. So he said that he tried that and they couldn't work. So this is, we had a lab out there. We did a lot of different things. And here we did a lot of rodent studies. So this, a lot of research was done leading to some really important information. Getting lots of that virus was in three categories, catching rats, eating rats, and having rats in the house. Eating rats, and rats are a good source of protein. And the boys used to kick, kill them, cut them in two, and spit roast them on the farm. That was nice snack. Then also, person-to-person -person spread was very, very important. But what we did discover is had to be close then what we do in the field, we try to teach people. So we have these pictures drawn by local people who tell them what to do. I was never quite too sure about the cat, because the trouble with the cat is it catches mouse and drags it in, and that's what we don't want. But you could see they were getting rid of the rats they killed, they were cleaning the house, they were trying to get the rats out of the food, and these kinds of things. And this is the Nigerian approach. Nigerians always have a different angle on life. <laughs> outbreaks. Take it Nigeria, where here I am trying to work in a, in a village where we had an outbreak, and we were actually chased with machetes at that point, because they decided that the last of you was due to witchcraft. And so we, we had a little bit of a problem there. Uh, but here is this outbreak where we were able to show in a hospital each of these arrows was a nurse, a nurse round, nurse going round with drugs in a hospital. They had a very small number of drugs. We were able to track the virus being transmitted from patient to patient to patient by reuse of needles and syringes into IV lines. So uh, that's probably still going on. We've seen this again and again and again, and it's still going on. It's still working. So here is, is, is uh, Sierra Leone for you, and here's what happened to Sierra Leone. And that was after we'd been there, it destroyed the program. Our people continued to work there continue to maintain the last support. And then they asked us back. And now they're living in refugee camps. And what happened in the refugee camps? It's last of people outbreaks. As you might well imagine. And that's about all I have to tell you. And if, I'd love to ask questions. If you've got questions, there's lots more I could say, but I won't.
Well, the head, the, yeah, the heads were so big. Um, and you know, it wasn't necessary. It wasn't necessary. I mean, you, you would find a situation where the nurse said, oh yes, we had to use the beans and syringes. Uh, and then what do you do? Well, we wash them in tepid, soapy water. Why? Why don't you boil them? They could boil Oh, it takes the marks off the syringe. We can't read the syringe. So, you know, they have no concept of what they're actually doing. These, when people do this, they do not know what they're doing. So you know, that is our problem. To some extent, we have the responsibility of taking this kind of medicine to places like that without the education of them. <laughs> no, eating it does not affect you. I've told you that. Cook it well, you're fine. Can what you, you must not touch is you know, it, it's the fresh blood or the fresh tissues. And of course, if we're not working with gloves, or we're working with tubes, broken glass, so there are all sorts of opportunities. If you if you look just now, if you look at your hands. Have you got tiny little nicks and cuts and scratches in them? Probably. And if you live in Africa, definitely, because you know you don't have the same protection. So you get some blood or some saliva or something in your hand, and it gets in the crack. That is the way it's transmitted. It does not come through the air. That I mean, that is absolutely the big story. Hemorrhagic fevers do not fly across the room. So I can go into my husband went into room four people with all the bone did not get infected because the virus does not jump. You've got to do something stupid. Could you uh, repeat or summarize the question, please? I'm sorry? When they ask the question, you okay. that, yes, that question was forgotten. <laughs> 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 yeah, but I'm distracted. Yes. Um, Shout. Let's give you a If you were to be, um, wait, if you had last fever while you were She's asking about Lassa fever in pregnancy and whether the baby would be handicapped. That is a very, very good question because Lassa and fever in pregnancy is very, very dangerous. Uh, we did a study up there, I didn't show it to you. What usually happens is that in the third trimester, that's the whole weeks, 28 to 40, what happens is the woman usually dies. And when she does, the baby dies too. So we had overall what we call fetal loss. Loss of the baby was 92%. So you, 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 we never saved the babies. And no, the, there was no congenital malformation for ones that survived. So it was quite different from what you think of. This was very acute, and it actually kills the baby. So it, it was, this is very bad. These, these women were very, very difficult to handle. Yes? <coughs> Is there some of the virus still going around right now? What? Is there some of the virus still going around in Nigeria right now? Yes. Now, it's politically not very acceptable. Uh, the Nigerians don't like it because they don't like The countries do not like this story to go around, so they tend to like to hush, hush it all up. So the outbreaks are ongoing all the time. We have friends in Nigeria who just tell us, Lassa fever is alive and well and living in Nigeria. Yeah. So, but you know, where, it's where you go and what you do that matters. If you stay in a four-star hotel, no problem. If you go and work in the field, in houses, in villages, and live in the villages, or work in a, in a, in a clinic or hospital of any kind, that's where you might pick it up. Yes? Um, you were saying the rats. Well, if you, if you eat the rat, you, you cut it up. Yeah, I understand that, but if it's bleeding in your house, it's set up there in 0.09%. Yeah. What, what happens is the houses, because it's hot out there, and they have no electricity, they keep the houses closed during the day. These animals are nocturnal. So they have, you know, 11 hours, of 20, you know, 20, 24 hours of good dark in advance, and they run around all the time. In the house, what happens is then they cook outside on the three stone fire. That's three stones like that. Fire and then you push the sticks in, put the pot on top. And um, then when they've finished eating, 
They may have a lantern. They finish eating. They take the plates, leftover food, and they push it under the bed. And they go to sleep. So the rodents have the ball and uh, go around peeing on it. Now the uh, rodents have 10 to the 3 viruses per mill in their urine for the rest of their life. So they're just peeing it over the beds, over the food, over everything else. And you pick it up in the morning and you lie down and you're on your pallet and you're in contact with the virus like that in all sorts and sorts of different ways. So you know, that's a very good question. Can you shout? Oh. <laughs> Well, no, the rest of, that was the rest of an outbreak, but that wasn't here. It was supposed to be, in, and it was an outbreak in Texas as well. It was not through the ventilation system. I worked on that outbreak. What it turned out, when the monkeys came in, they were giving them uh, TB tests. So they pulled up this TB stuff, you know, you put it in and see if you get a lump. And uh, so they were doing this to the monkeys, and they do it just above the eye like that. And so they would draw up enough for 12 monkeys and just go around like that. Mm -hmm. that, yeah. is, that is my question. I don't know if anyone's read in the current science discovery, they actually found a DNA sample of the Black Plague in London. I, they pulled it out yes. of bones. Then there's been another study that's just come out that is actually very similar. You're saying in the 76 outbreak, you learned everything there was about the needle vector, yes. the hospital vectors, HIV is now being attributed back. There's somebody who's just come out with a history of HIV and they're looking at exactly the same vector pattern in the hospital environments where AIDS virus is prominent. The reuse of equipment, not boiling, not cleaning, may be the beginning of where AIDS epidemic eventually came from. Not as we know it right this minute, but at the beginning of it in the 70s when it started to be seen in sporadic outbreaks. We're, this is what you do every day. What do you see with solve that? Is it education? Is it? Well, there's very, very good data for this. When we went to, uh, we did a study in, in Northern Zaria in Yambuku, we went back 10 years later, and we looked for all the people who survived. And we found that in, 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 in the zero survey uh, that we did during the Ebola outbreak, point, uh, point, point eight percent of the population had HIV. We went back 10 years later. So we went back 10 years later, did the same thing again, and the answer was, does anybody guess what it would be 10 years later, HIV? No, 0.8%. So what is the story? The story is, anybody come from a small country town in the US? Everybody knows everybody else's business, don't they? Uh, so in these, so you have your hunter going into the forest, he catches a monkey, kills a monkey, comes home, gets infected. Maybe he infects his wife. Then what happens? Well, you know, no hanky-panky, else he'd be in trouble. Big trouble. So it doesn't spread in the community. <laughs> then later on, of course, when people, the men in particular, went down to the river, and then they went down to Kinshasa, and then they lived in the slums, and they frequented prostitutes, leaving their wives back in the village, that's when it became explosive. And then, of course, they go back to the village and infect their wives. So that's, that's really what happened in the 80s, 70s, 80s, 70s and 80s. So, you know, the HIV, we're responsible for the HIV epidemic, there's no question about it. It's the human behavior that made that happen. It wasn't anything wild about the virus. The virus has probably been doing this for centuries and centuries and centuries, but it never became epidemic. In fact, the interesting thing about uh, HIV, and there's a very nice study showing this, is HIV only becomes epidemic if you have a very a small number of people with a very, very high rate of sexual contact. So this happens if you've got a group of prostitutes who have 5, 10, 15 contacts a night then it explodes. Um, otherwise, it's not really that infectious. So it has no <laughs> That the clinic basis, we think, is also important and is a whole other story. 
And we have been yelling about this for years and years. It took us 10 years for WHO to pay any attention to this because we were seeing the same type, same thing with hepatitis C. Uh, and this was in Pakistan, same story. You go to a, to a clinic and they had 20 patients outside and inside they got three meals and syringes. Then you go into another clinic, oh yes, we've got a sterilizer, electric sterilizer for the syringes and needles. No electricity. <laughs> so, so I, you just get used to it and talk to people and try to invent them, try, try to educate them. Oops. Yes, do you have a question? And the question is, were there any in the rainforests of South America? The answer is yes, there are. The ones in South America are not bats. They're mainly rodents, different kinds of rodents, calamus, paramus. And those rodents in Argentina, in Bolivia, in Uruguay, and some in, in Brazil, and in um, Rhodes, Venezuela. And there have been outbreaks. But they're not as bad as Lassa fever, but they're related to Lassa fever. Ebola, nothing. Ebola is, we think, an old world disease, not a new world disease. Um, the interesting thing about the rodents, this I found fascinating, is if you look at the genetics of the viruses and the genetics of the rodents, the viruses and the rodents co-evolved. And it looks as though they go right back nine million years to when there was only one continent. And then as they split, each virus, each rodent, went its own way. So it's, it's, it's a nice evolutionary story. And unfortunately, I think we're out of time for tonight. Can we please give our our students? I know that there are other questions. Please feel free to come forward at the end of the talk and talk to our speaker in person. Again, if you need the extra credit stamp, that's front door on your way out. Thank you again for coming.